The French in existentialism go way back, from Francois Truffaut turning rom-coms and teen movies into philosophy papers, to Jean-Paul Sartre and his belief that humans are condemned to freedom. Questioning existence has long since been a part of Gaelic culture, and why wouldn't it be if you had to face every day in the knowledge that you're literally French? But never before have I seen the existential doubt that plagues us all so well articulated as in the pre-match face of Guillaume Garrado, a man staring into the void preparing to be the sole bastion of sense in the mass madcap neon shit show his teammates are about to serve up. I've never quite seen pain, determination, desire, and a preemptive feeling, oh for god's sake, what is the point? Articulated as well as it is when etched across Garado's freakishly box-like head every time he lines up in the tunnel. Never mind being condemned to freedom, Garado is condemned to living out his boyhood dream as captain of his national rugby team, only to discover that they're like this every week. And after being the only French player who looked like he'd heard of rugby before rocking up to play at Twickenham last week, it would have been entirely reasonable for the French captain to have expected the worst. And in some ways, he got it, as France remained about as predictable as the Spanish Inquisition, abandoned abandoning any semblance of an attacking game plan inside the first minute in favour of bonkers offloading and passing the ball to Bastereau. Their opposition for the day was Scotland, but not that it mattered. Everything any French player does at this point is a bit like my continued references to French cinema, purely done just to entertain the person doing it. So how did this shower of nonsense pay off for France? And should Scotland be worried that they let this happen? It's not so long ago that Scotland and Argentina were regularly battling it out to be the most French team in Test Rugby. And on Saturday, the Scots showed signs of once again buying into their host style of toxically entertaining rugby. This was perhaps most obvious with their selection at 10. With Finn Russell injured, Scotland opted to avoid sugarcoated standoff Adam Hastings and hand Pete Horn only his third start in the 10 jersey, the previous two being losses to Fiji and Italy respectively. Horn, or McHook as I might start calling him, is usually a centre with occasional delusions of 10 jaw. His familiarity the centre position did allow for some interesting innovations from Scotland, who several times went straight to Sam Johnson as first receiver, causing France to expect a crash ball before playing out the back and trying to catch the defence off guard. Scotland's mistake, however, was thinking that France might try to analyse the game in front of them as it happened and do something in reaction, rather than just lazily running the pattern they vaguely remember being told to in that one training session they went to. Even ignoring the handful of mistakes, Horn at 10 didn't really work because Horn isn't a game manager. People often mix game management up with decision making, but Horn's issue was that he wasn't marshalling the team around him. Contrast how much more organised Scotland's attacking shape looked when Hastings came on to with Horn at 10. Picking Pete Horn at fly half is a bit like trying to make a plane entirely out of wings. Yes, it's something that helps you fly, but you're doing it at the expense of the engine. Scotland's selection snafu was pretty ironic when you consider France actually kind of got it right. Surely they landed on DuPont and under Mac by accident after their last pair of halfbacks were dropped for publicly saying that the coach is shit at his job, but it worked, the pair providing just the engine France lacked in the first two games. They're somewhat less composed than Parrot and Lopez, who have the game management I talked about down to a T, but boy did the young alternatives provide some engine. DuPont being at the heart of basically everything good France did, and Untermach finishing off this wondrous little try. This, again, came from France deciding to field a sensible selection. Last match, France had to haul number 15, Yohan Uge, off at half-time, which came as a huge surprise because it implied he was playing in the first half. But this week, they made amends for the batshit backfield in Twickenham by choosing the informed fullback in France to play fullback for France, which is a novel idea that I'm not sure will ever catch on. I'm a big fan of everything about Thomas Ramos, right down to the fact that he sometimes drops high balls because he's too busy daydreaming about the try of the year contender he's going to score when he catches it. We saw precisely why I rate him here, beating defenders, drawing the man, and eventually stepping in at scrum off to deliver the scoring pass to Untermach, who furthers Garado's existential dread by hogging the ball when you know, he really should have passed to his captain. Scotland also created opportunities, but they lack the instinct to finish them off. Taking the most guilt edge of the lot here, a lovely set move puts Maitland into space, but he's left trying to finish it on his own. Tommy Seymour is there, but his support line is poor, hugging the touchline when he should have cut in and looked to provide a genuine option. Wherever Scotland broke the line, they just struggled to find any support, meaning it was up to them individually to beat the actually in position fullback and any other random Frenchman who happened to fancy a walk and dawdled into the backfield. The one exception was, indeed, the one that proved the rule, with Horn slicing through and finding an actual support runner who goes over for Scotland's only try. You can say pretty much for certain Greg Laidlaw would not have scored that try because do, 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 you, know what, do you know what it is? That's early price. Scotland essentially only remembered how to play in the last five minutes of the match, which luckily for them lasted about 15 minutes. One man who did manage to play throughout the entire match, however, was Jamie Ritchie. 
Without human pinball Hamish Watson and human magnet John Barkley, Scotland fans may have had a right to worry about their seven shirt, but Richie has given them no reason. He was excellent against Ireland and stood out again against France, becoming the second biggest nuisance to the French after themselves. He's very good at the breakdown, he's a handful in the loose, and he's a guy Wales and England are going to have to keep a real close eye out on the games coming up. Because both sides have to now go off and remember how to play proper matches against opposition less keen on this kind of loose, harebrained shit. This match may not have been a classic, but it was certainly an entertaining opener before the Wales-England game, a bit like the ancient Greek theatre tradition of always having a silly like comedy on to entertain the audience as they were settling down before the engrossing, heart-rending existentialist drama they've actually come to see. Scotland lacked the correct parts to break France down in the first half, and then once they did find them, they couldn't quite slot them together in the second. And France? France just continued to happen. And that's not going to stop anytime soon either. But you suspect, as long as they continue to happen like they did on Saturday, Gillian Garrado may not feel so condemned to continue to live out his dream. I recognise that might not have been the most in-depth analysis I've ever done on the match, but it was just a silly game. Like that was a it was a farce of a rugby match. And I enjoyed it for that. I thought it was kind of good fun for that. So I thought I'd make a video looking at the damage it's done on Gil and Garado's psyche. Um, beyond that, thank you to Rugby Warfare for continuing to sponsor the channel. If you do want to get 20% off anything at all on their website, and I mean anything at all, it's a really good deal. Uh, you can use the offer code SQ20 and get 20% off um, and any anything, absolutely anything. Um, and then thank you to everyone that supports the channel on Patreon. It makes a huge difference for allowing me to do this and allowing me to afford food whilst I'm doing this. Um, and then thank you for watching this uh, and if you do want to continue you know watch more things like this there's going to be more over the course of the six nations if you don't want to watch more things like this then suit yourself but thank you for watching through to the end of the video anyway